Great students, such a good energy, especially after the giveaway. <laughs> How many of you have seen the movie Shrek? I am most of you, and if you haven't seen it, you probably know of it. One of my favorite parts from the part one of Shrek is when uh, Donkey and Shrek are going, are on their way to release Fiona from the dragon. And they are standing right at the edge of a cliff, overlooking the castle. There is a crooked bridge uh, connecting both sides. And also there's like a lot of fires burning underneath. It was a horrifying view. And right at the moment, Shrek uh, says a punchline. It's big enough, but look at the location. It's actually a perfect punchline at the perfect moment. It is famously known as that real estate joke. What amazes me as a writer is how a little word made of only three letters, very unpretentious, very small, can not only change the meaning of a sentence, but it can also prepare you for the truth. And I'm talking about the adverb, but. I found this very interesting uh, explanation in an online dictionary. The adverb but negates or cancels everything that goes before it and is generally accepted as a signal that the really important part of the sentence is coming up. So, but look at the location. This is the important part. And once you hear that, you really want to double check the size of the castle. OK, enough with Shrek. We're all adults here, students falling in love, falling out of love. We've all gone through our breakups. And you all know that one of the most horrible, really difficult sentences to hear at the end of, you know, the relationship starts like this. I love you, but... And you know that what goes ahead after the but, it's a breakup call. Do you really care about the love part of the moment? Not really, because you know that they're leaving. Okay, okay, you're laughing, but you're probably asking yourself, where is she taking us? Well, I'm taking you here. Nothing <laughs> to do with the breakup part. This is my country, Albania. For all of you who don't know a lot, I mean, I know there are a lot of Albanians here, but for others who don't know a lot or don't know anything, in 2020, Albania was rated as one of the top five poorest countries in Europe. And I know that my shoes won't help with the statistics. <laughs> yeah. But we're from the Balkans, so. <laughs> Albania is in Europe, but not in the European Union. It has beautiful, beautiful, amazing beaches, but not as many and not as famous as Greece is, our neighboring country. Albania has amazing, really, really delicious food. But right across the Adriatic, there's Italy, world famous for its cuisine. Albania has a very, very young population. The median age is 36.4. But according to the recent data, 80% of the students want to leave the country and build a life elsewhere. According to the United Nations statistics from 1990 to 2020, 1.2 million Albanians have left the country, and that is one-third of the population. Okay, but look at the location. Yes, facts are facts, truth is truth. But you cannot count love into statistics. You can't. How do you do that? Uh, Albanians do love their homeland, like everybody else, they love their homeland. But unfortunately, but unfortunately, those economic truths are the ones that push us away and cancel out love and history. I would love to live here, but this place doesn't offer me much. This is the main argument of those 80% of students that were surveyed in 2021 in Albania. Now let's do something with the sentence. This place doesn't offer me much, but I would love to live here. Do you notice a difference in tone? Okay, we'll go back to that. But first, let's go back 20 years ago. September 11th, 2001, you probably were born back then. I, was, I just graduated from college. <laughs> I was an adult, unfortunately. 
And uh, I was working, I was living in America right when uh, the terrorist attacks happened. I was uh, wasting away my work permit. And uh, I wanted to do something to stay in America. I really wanted to stay in America and do something that I would love. So guess where I went right after the terrorist attacks? A month later, I moved to New York. <laughs> that wasn't the best time. New York was wounded. And uh, I was applying. I wanted to apply to anything that had to do with creativity and writing and nothing to do with my major political science. Uh, so I sent out my resumes everywhere, publishing houses. I sent it to magazines, uh, sent it to film studios. And my top choice was a very, very famous music television that I grew up watching. I was expecting, because all my friends told me that I was amazing and creative and authentic, I was expecting that at least one potential employer would call me back. Guess how many called back? Zero. Apparently, my uh, close to expiration work permit, my lack of education and experience in the requested field, there were enough reasons for me to be rejected. I was a little, I cannot say depressed, I'm not a very depressive kind, but I was uh, disappointed and sad because I had to stay there. I could not go back home. You know, my father had paid so much for my education, for eight years of living and studying expenses, that I just couldn't go back. It would be a failure, a disaster. So I had the following choices. Get married for a green card. I'm too romantic, really. Apply for a political asylum and stay away from my country for 80 years. First of all, I cannot lie. I'm a really bad liar to the government. And second, where does my freedom go of movement? The third choice was working in the service industry illegally like all of my Albanian, most of my Albanian friends, but I was working as a hostess in a restaurant at the moment and I hated it. And the last one was to apply for my master's and extend my student visa, meaning I have to call dad again for more money to go for my master's and to study on what? I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And then there was the other choice, that of failing, going back home. So I had a lot of sleepless nights wondering why, how bad I want to be here. Until August of 2002, a friend of mine came, uh, moved to America, and we were having a conversation, and she was talking to me about this television that was opening in Albania. And she said, the owner is crazy. He says he's going to make, build the biggest and best television, not only in Albania, but also one of the best in the Balkans. And it's going to be like crazy, modern, fresh, innovative. You know, like the music television we used to watch? Say what? I think I just found my call. I was like, I'm going to go back. I didn't think about Albania, about the failure part, about my parents. I just thought about the television. That was my focus. I want to go back. So after that call, I had to make another phone call to my parents, who were clearly in shock. So it went like this. You can't come back. We have invested so much in you. But, but mom, this is such a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, great opportunity, but this is Albania. If there were so many great opportunities, nobody would have left. And she was right. I was calling from America, the land of opportunities. But really, who says that an opportunity is a good enough opportunity if it's only given to the, a certain location? So I stated my argument, okay, Albania is not America, but it's a vibrant up-and-coming place and people are willing to experiment. Yes, I don't have any background in television, but I have a U.S. degree and going back in 2001 with a U.S. degree, I'll be one of the rarest ones. And yes, Albania is so different from America because it's not a land of opportunities. It's a little pond of opportunities, invisible. Uh, but mom, uh, I, if I work hard, I might be the big fish in a small pond. So eventually my butts won. I went back. A month later, and uh, the next month in October, I started working as a reporter for this newly opened television. And it was the best decision of my life. Within three years, I got to do so much, and I gained so much experience that I don't think I would have gotten those three years waiting to be legalized in America. I traveled all over the world. I reported live from the White House, from Banda Aceh, from the, the 2004 tsunami from the afterward Kosovo. I got to interview a lot of political leaders, a lot of celebrities. I learned how to do documentaries, and I learned 
also how to, uh, well, I mean, one step towards my film uh, passion and how to run TV shows. I did so much in such a short time and still in my early 20s. It was incredible. And at the moment, I, I thought that, okay, Albania is not a land of opportunities, but it can be a land of amazing opportunities if you can just look for it in the right place. Albania is not the land of opportunities per international standards, too, but when you think of it, how eager are people in developing places to learn and to grow and even experiment with things that were done before in other countries. Like I started my own fashion magazine. I did nothing that was not done in America or Western Europe, but I guess I did something right because it became the highest selling magazine in the country. Albania was not a stable democracy. Things would start big and soon fade. But in these places, you learn to reinvent yourself all the time if you go along with it and you learn a lot about media and politics and business, and I learned a lot about public relations. My audience was made mostly of women in their late 20s, early 30s. Women were ambitious, smart, but pessimistic. And their issue became my opportunity to expand my brand and build one of the biggest communities online for women. So, I came to the result that there isn't such as a land of opportunities, you can make your own opportunity. And now, 20 years later and 30 years, 30 more years later, from my childhood dream, I finally got to write and co-produce the first TV series. And now I set my foot really in the film industry. With one third of the budget, it was very difficult, but I worked with a great team of people that share the same philosophy as I did. Albania is what it is, but you can make your own opportunity. I would love to live here, we'll go back to the sentence, but this place doesn't offer me much. Some of you might say right now that I'm too optimistic, and some Albanians too, I know. But, you know, sometimes there are no opportunities, really. I mean, if you want to be a rocket scientist and there is no rocket technology in your country, of course, what are you going to do? You're going to move where the market is. You can't make Albania build our, your country, build a rocket system. But many times, I mean, sometimes it is what it is that they say on TikTok. Well, I mentioned that. <laughs> but, but sometimes it is more than that. But we do choose to not look because we're fed to some particular truths, to some particular statistics, and other people's experiences. And it's crazy sometimes how much we rely on other people's journeys that we forget to acknowledge that those people that tell us that you've got to move, there are no opportunities here, including our parents, are people that maybe haven't even tried to look for one in the first place. Now let's go back to this sentence. This place doesn't offer me much, but I would love to live here. And as the tone changes, so with this kind of mindset comes the desire to actually go ahead and explore, do your best. Now, I said big fish in a small pond, sometimes the ponds get suffocating. I mean, you take from the country so much or from the place, not just the country, and then it's over. I mean, you, you saw the opportunities, you use them. This is where I am right now. I mean, I set my foot in the film industry, and now I realize that I want to move from my country professionally or physically. I want to explore bigger audiences, bigger and more established film markets, but it's okay. And you know why? Because once you do and try and test and win and fail, and once you come to that moment of decision to find more opportunities, bigger ponds, bigger oceans, you will have no regrets, no what ifs. I did my best here, but it's time to go. It's time to go, but I did my best. There's no tone changes here. No. Really, it's just full of confidence. Because when you're at this point of doing your best, and you're sure that this is all you can take and give, but it's nothing so important. It's just there to connect to parts of sentences, not canceling one over the other. It's just like an end. Because I think that beyond dictionary and beyond uh, grammar, Language is our thoughts, and our thoughts are our life. So at the end, I know that uh, some of you might be at the same point I was many years ago, going through a guilt trip, feeling like I failed my parents, throwing away their, parent, their investment, 
for seeing an opportunity where others couldn't or didn't want to. I want you to take with you these questions when you go home today or whenever you're ready. It's always about whenever you're ready, when you come to the point of asking yourself, this place doesn't offer me much, but do I know what I want? What can I offer that will be of use? Am I looking enough? Am I looking in the right places? Do I have the right qualifications? Do I have the right skills? Once you go through this checklist, many times, you might be really confident that, no, there are no opportunities. I have to go, and it's OK. But please, try and test for your own. There are so many truths, so many statistics, so much da data around. So many organizations just getting paid to do these things for us. But the truth that you make for yourself is what really matters. Thank you.